Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, everyone. First, I would like to welcome you all to one of the College of Engineering lecture series. Today, we are honored to host Prof. Charles al for the second time. Uh, Prof. Charles al is a professor of electrical engineering and planetary science at California Institute of Technology. From 2001 to 2016, he was the director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at NASA and the vice president of California Institute of Technology. Prof. al oversaw the development and the operation of over 45 flight missions and instruments. Also, as a JBL director, JBL launched mission 24 missions, such as JSON-1, Spirit, Grace, Dawn, CloudSat, and until JSON-3 at 2016. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Prof. Charles Alashi uh, to give his talk today on future advances on Earth observations from space. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and she pronounces my name very well, Elashi. Assalamu <laughs> uh, alaikum and good afternoon. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. It's uh, always a pleasure for me to come here. This is my second visit uh, in here, and uh, uh, part of the credit to go to uh, Nasreen El Saud, uh, because Nasreen came and spent uh, five months working with me at Caltech, and she runs the show. She, she ran a project, you know, that uh, for students, and she told me, when I told her I came and visited Al Faisal University and gave a talk, she said, yeah, but I'm here. You know, I was not there, so you need to come back again. Uh, so what I'm going to do today, last time, if you recall, I talked mostly about planetary exploration and space exploration. Uh, today, I'm focused more about our planet. And part of the reason I want to focus on our planet is, as you know, there is a lot of concern about global change, sea rise, uh, global warming. So I thought particularly for young people like you, it would be good to really be familiar of what are we doing in being able to monitor our planet and monitor our environment uh, and hopefully help the policymakers uh, and all of us uh, to work the policies which will allow us to protect our planet. So this is, uh, oops, how to get rid of this. No? Oh, that must be your computer, Nora, huh? No, no. <laughs> that was not mine, but Maybe we'll take it. No? There we go. Okay. Thank you. So when you look at our planet, this was taken from a satellite, you don't see boundaries, you don't see countries. So we are all living on this, uh, on this planet. And so everybody you know, everybody you like, everybody you don't like, they are all living on this planet. And we really need to take good care of it. And one thing I want to kind of... Uh, a point to you, look at the atmosphere, how thin it is. The atmosphere is only a few tens of kilometers, and that's what's protecting us, and that's the, the, the atmosphere that we are concerned about really doing much you know, damage to it in addition to, uh, to what's happening on the surface. So let me tell you a little bit about how do we observe you know, our planet. Now, we do a lot of satellite. But also there are observations done from aircraft or observations done from uh, drones. Now they are becoming much more common. And a lot of the technology we are developing actually can also be used in submarine and ocean sensing. We use different parts of the spectrum. It's acoustic versus electromagnetic. Uh, but the technology is very, very similar. And what you see on the left is an example of an app which we call Eyes on Earth. You know, uh, that, uh, that you can go and Google and you can access it on your iPhone. 
And basically, it allows you to see different parameters of, uh, or different characteristics of what's happening around our planet every day. So you have on it all the data from our satellites, and you'll be able to, to, to see what is the temperature today around the world, what is uh, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, any of the parameters that you are measuring from our satellites come down in almost real time within 24 hours, and it's updated on a regular basis every few hours, and you can see it on your iPhone. And hopefully this will be a tool for making us all aware of what's happening you know, on our planet. So let me tell you of two techniques that, uh, that are kind of becoming very popular now and they're going to have a big impact in the future. Uh, you are all familiar with colored photography. And basically, it's, we have a couple of parts of the spectrum, red, blue, green, and we combine them and you get the colored images. What we are developing now or, uh, or testing and will be flying in the near future are imaging spectrometer, which means instead of taking a couple of colors, we take 260 colors. That means we look at in the visible, we look at the infrared, we look at the thermal infrared, and we build what we call a cube of like 260 images, you know, of an area. And then what we do, if we go to one pixel, let's say this pixel here in this area, oops, I think maybe I'd better not play with it. And if we go, oops, let me move to the next one. I'm learning, Nora, I'm learning how to use it. So if we go to one of the pixel, you know, in there and look along the depths of it over the 260 channels, we get a signature of the spectrum. And then from that spectrum, looking at the libraries that we develop, we can tell you exactly what's the composition at that surface. So you can map, like say, the kingdom, and every 20 meter, we can tell you exactly what's, what's the composition on the surface. Now that's of interest to mineral resources. But also it's interest if you're looking at vegetation. We can tell you what kind of vegetation is growing in that pixel. Is it corn or is it wheat? We can tell you the health of the vegetation because that impacts the spectrum. And we can tell you if there is need to be irrigating, if it's moisture or there is not much moisture in it. And we can do that worldwide every day on a regular basis. So this illustrates some of the new technologies that is coming online that we'll be using over the next, over the next decade. The other technique we, uh, is becoming more popular is using radar instrument. Now, radar will provide you, you know, with images. So what we do with the radar, we transmit the pulse and we wait for the echo to reflect from the surface and come back. And then we do a trick. I'm not going to describe it to you necessarily, but you can go and Google it, what we call synthetic aperture radar, where we take series of these pulses and by combining them, we can generate an image similar to the image that you get from a camera, except in this case, because we are using radar and microwave, number one, we are using our own signal that we are transmitting, so we don't rely on the sun to illuminate the surface. And then also because it's microwave, it can see through clouds. So that means we can get images all the time. It doesn't matter if it's cloudy or not cloudy, day or night, we can image the surface. And to give you an idea about what these images look like, this is an example of the image over the Los Angeles Basin. So at the top, you see the Long Beach Harbor. At the bottom, you see the island of uh, Catalina for the people who are familiar with that area. But what I want to illustrate to you, look at all the ships in the harbor. So we can actually image the ship and keep track of them. And you can see some of the ships actually have to have a wake behind them so we can tell in which direction they are moving. So this will allow us to monitor the traffic of ships uh, on a regular basis, every day, day or night, you know, again, on a worldwide basis. But also as scientists who are interested, you see features in the ocean. These are reflected on the currents which are happening in that ocean, in the waves. So a lot of the oceanographer use this basically for predicting, uh, you know, where the currents are in that area. So that's one illustration of what this kind of radar technique can do. And to kind of show you the images, this is, these are kind of, uh, 
These are radar images. They look very much like a camera image. If I didn't tell you this is radar, you would have believed me. Uh, these are lakes up in, uh, in Alaska. And the color here is not the color that you see with your eye, but because we use different part of the microwave spectrum that you don't see, we don't see with our eyes, and we give them color. And then also we can do polarization. So like you use polarized glasses, and the polarization give us more information you know, about the surface. And the other feature of these radar instruments that they can also penetrate below dry areas like you have here in Saudi Arabia. This image was taken from the radar over northern Egypt, uh, sorry, over northern Africa in southern Egypt next to, the, next to the Libyan border. The yellow image is a visual image taken with a camera. And you can see it's all look like sand. In the middle, you see a strip which was taken with the radar instrument. And all of a sudden, you see what looks like a drainage channel. So what turned out, to make a long story short, that the radar signal is seeing through the sand, down a few meters below the surface, and is mapping the rivers which used to exist during the pharaohs and during the old days before the area got covered you know, with sand. So this allows us to map the drainage channels, which existed many thousand years ago, below the surface. And this is of interest, the archaeologists are very interested in it because uh, that allows to see old ruins. And, uh, and the hydrologists are interested because they can see where are the sources of rivers a few thousand years ago before climate change. So one of the things that we'll be doing on a mission coming up that I'll discuss uh, shortly is we'll be able to map all the kingdom and be able to see all where all the rivers used to be in the kingdom and possibly some, uh, some archaeological area. Matter of fact, we did a major project in Oman. If you go in and Google the city of Ubar, which was mentioned in the Bible, and that used to be a major trading you know, city, we actually now is becoming one of the archaeological sites that people visit. And that was kind of uh, discovered or mapped using this kind of techniques. And then also we can do three-dimensional images. So this image of the Los Angeles Basin was taken from a satellite radar using a technique we call interferometry. And so now all the images, when you look at 3D images in Saudi Arabia or anywhere, they came from that instrument. And in 12 days, we were able to map the whole world and generate the 3D, 3D images down to resolution of about like 20 meters. So that illustrates to you some of these capabilities that are coming online that, uh, that we are using now. And the last technique I want to mention to you, let's see if I go on the next one, is that if we take an image today, you know, with this radar instrument, and then we come back tomorrow and something has changed on the surface, like if we are in California, an earthquake happened and the surface has moved, or sand dunes have been moving slowly, or there is inflation because a volcano is ready to erupt. Even if the change is about a centimeter, we can map that from space. So we'll be able to tell you about all the changes which are happening resulting from either human or natural kind of impact on doing that. So we are planning a satellite called NISAR that will be launching two years from now. And it's a satellite which will map the whole world every 12 days. And it will give us coverage like you see in this map. So every 12 days we'll be mapping the whole world and measuring the changes which are happening. So one of the projects we are doing with CACs here is to be able to map the kingdom literally every 12 days and repeatedly over years, and we'll be able to basically extract you know, the changes which are happening from human or, or, or natural you know, kind of impact. So this will be a very exciting new capability. This spacecraft will be launched two years from now. So this is a very exciting new capability that is coming online. And there are a number of other satellites, you know, European as well. So it's not only the U.S. satellite, but this is the one which will be able to measure that surface change every, every 12 days. So now let me tell you where we are focusing on, on understanding what's happening on our planet. And there are four areas that I'm going to tell you a little bit about. One is the uh, sea rise. 
uh, there is a lot of concern that the ocean is actually rising and areas which are along the coast over the next couple of decades, if that continues, they could get flooded. The next one, which is top right, is looking at water resources. I don't need to tell you in the Middle East, water resources are, are very important for all of us now. In other places, they are not, but, but across the Middle East, it's a major issue because we are pumping too much water from the water table. And it's a major issue in California, you know, also. And I'll show you an example about what's happening. Uh, the bottom right is about looking at natural hazards. And I will give you some example of it. And the bottom left is looking at the atmosphere and what's happening in the atmosphere, putting carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases, methane. So I will go a little bit more in detail about each one of, the, of these four areas. But these are the areas that we're doing a lot of focus to understand what's happening on our planet. And most of our satellites are geared you know, to understand these four different areas. So let me start with natural uh, uh, hazard. Uh, in California, we, we get a lot of earthquakes. And therefore, it's very important two things. One, to really understand where is the stress on the surface and the bending of the plate so we can hopefully predict areas of high risk of earthquake. And the other one, when an earthquake happened, we would like to be informing the rescuers very quickly about where was most of the damage that happened. So as you can see on the left side, this is taken from satellite images using the technique I mentioned to you earlier, looking at the change. And where you see these fringes, which are very close to each other, that means there was a lot of motion. When they are separated, there means there was a less motion. So this way we can tell the rescuer where to go because where there is a lot of motion, most likely that's where the damage has happened, like what you see on the right hand side. And this technology, we have been deploying or, or uh, applying it for a recent earthquake which happened in, uh, in the Himalayas and, and recent, uh, also uh, uh, recent uh, uh, the lava flows which happened in, uh, in Hawaii. And remember, we're talking about centimeter movement, so the slightest earthquake kind of effect will be able to map it from space. And also we are applying this here in the kingdom. So that, uh, that's one of the projects that uh, researchers at CACS are working on. And as you know, there is a lot of talk about building, I mean, uh, there are plans of building the city of Neom in the northwest part of the kingdom. And that's an area which is fairly tectonically active. That's why we have the Red Sea, because there is basically a plate, which is the Ethiopian plate and the Saudi plate, which are moving relative to each other. And that's what created basically the Red Sea in there. So we are doing mapping of that area to see where is the stress and how can we inform the people who are doing the construction you know, in that area that this is a high risk area, therefore you have to do certain, doing construction in a certain, certain way. So for instance, in Los Angeles, all the tall building, you say, say, why are they building these in area where there are earthquakes? Well, they are all on rollers. So when an earthquake happened, because we know, it, you know it's high risk, actually the building goes back and forth instead of bending. And, and uh, so these are examples of how we're applying these to the kingdom. And then we'll be able to do that on a regular basis, you know, as we get that satellite flying in two years from now. And if you zoom on one area, you can see on the right what actually happened in that area. So it's really a significant displacement. So if you had, let's say, pipes or pipelines in that area and you didn't know that it's going to be, have this activity, you can damage a lot of the infrastructure. And we apply the same things for volcanoes. You don't have very many volcanoes here. Even that you have volcanic, a lot of volcanic fields on the western side you know, of the kingdom. But when a volcano is ready to erupt, we could see the surface kind of inflating a little bit. And we see it from the satellite doing that. So we can warn about where actually the, it's going to break and the lava flow will, will be happening. And this show you in the southern part of Hawaii. Actually, we have been monitoring the rift which is happening from that volcano. And, and this area, there was a major eruption uh, about two years ago. And there was a lot of damage which have happened, but at least we were able to warn the, the, the inhabitants about where the lava flows will be happening and to make sure they go to safer, safer areas. So let me tell you a little bit about the water now. Now the water is a very precious resource. We all need it for our life, we need it for our vegetation, but the vast majority of the water is in the oceans. 
So only 3% of the water on our planet is actually fresh water. And then out of that 3%, you have about two thirds of it, which is in glaciers. So it's not, you cannot access it here in Saudi Arabia. It will be very challenged to get glaciers and, uh, and ice flows to come here. And one third of it is in the ground. And only about 1% of it is on the surface. And then from the surface water, a lot of it are in lakes and a small amount are in river. So we are, we are planning, oh, sorry, and when you look at the water tables, you can see a lot of areas where the water table is being depleted. And one of the major concern in the kingdom and the Middle East, that there is a lot of depletion you know, of the water table. And the same thing, by the way, happened in California. So we can learn from each other of how do we manage that. And the key challenge is how do you manage it? I mean, here in Saudi Arabia, you have even an additional challenge in California, we get snow on the mountains. So after we deplete some of the water table and the snow melt, you know, we refill, you know, the, here in Saudi Arabia, the water is left over from many thousand years ago. So you get some, some water which comes in from remote areas like from Lebanon and from an under, under the ground or from Iraq, but, but you don't have the capacity of refilling it on a regular basis. So it's important that you manage it you know, very well, not to pump too much water and, and, uh, and to use it, uh, you know, to, to use it in a thoughtful, thoughtful way. So we are launching a satellite, matter of fact, later this year, which is called SWAT, as you can see, surface water and ocean topography. And this satellite will map on a regular basis where the water is, how much water is, how much we are losing, how much water we are actually losing in those areas. And it's a joint project with the French Space Agency. And then we have another satellite, which is called the GRACE. And this satellite uses a very interesting trick to be able to measure the water table, you know, under the ground. Because the previous one I mentioned to you, we can measure what we see on the surface. But we cannot penetrate many hundred meters or thousand meters below the surface. So the trick we use is by using two satellites following each other and measuring the distance between them very accurately. When the first satellite comes over an area where there is a change of gravity, if there is an extra gravity, it will speed up a little bit. And then when the next one follows it and feels that gravity, it catch up with it. So by measuring the distance, we can determine the gravity field. Then you say, well, what's interesting about the gravity field? Well, if there is a water table and you are pumping water from it, you are losing mass, and therefore the gravity drops down a little teeny bit. And if you are feeding water in that water table, you have more mass, and therefore it has a little bit more gravity that goes up. So by measuring the gravity, we are able to determine the changes below the surface, you know, about the water table. Now, uh, every time I present here this in Saudi Arabia, people immediately will say, well, can you separate oil from, from water? The answer is no, we cannot do it from space because both of them have mass. Both of them, when you pump oil, you are pulling out mass from under the surface. However, when you complement it with, uh, with uh, surface trues, I mean, uh, you know, from wells, uh, we can actually tell if it's this area is water or if it's oil in that area. And by using this technique, we have been monitoring in California the water tables. As you can see in the bottom left picture, you can see the water table goes up and down, up and down, because in the winter, we get water from the Sierra. In the summer, we pump it for agriculture. But on the average, it's going down. So that created a lot of concern in the state. So now the state of California is using our data to manage better and tell the farmers how much water they can pick up and do more efficient ways you know, of actually uh, you know, watering the different fields in California. So this brings an awareness you know, of the challenge that we are facing. And hopefully one of the projects we are working with CAC is to do similar things here in the kingdom. And this shows you over long term, as you can see, the loss of water that we had over the last uh, 20 years, you know, over the whole part of the Central Valley in California. So that's what created the awareness in the government agencies that we need to do a better job in ma managing our water. And this is worldwide. So here you can see the changes which were happening. And as you can see, in the, particularly in the Middle East, there is a lot of loss you know, of water, as well as in California. In other areas, there is an increase 
you know, in the water mass. Now, another way we are using it to be able to measure also water close to the surface is uh, this synthetic aperture radar I mentioned to you earlier that will be mapping the world every two weeks. And this shows you an image of the Los Angeles Basin. And what you are seeing here over a period of six years, the changes in the surface. Because when we pump water from under the surface, the surface subsides a little bit. And then when you inject water in it, it moves up a little bit. So this actually tells us how Los Angeles Basin is breathing because of the pumping of the water and in some situations the pumping of the oil because we have a number of oil fields in that area. So two years from now, we'll be able to do this for the whole kingdom. So you'll be seeing across the whole kingdom down to centimeter, how is it breathing? So you would think things are not moving because you don't feel them moving, but in actuality, things are moving under your feet up and down depending you know, what's happening below the surface in that area. So this will allow you to basically observe all the changes which are happening in the kingdom on a regular basis. The other thing that we can do also from space is to measure moisture in the ground. So we can, because what happens when you have water, when, when the soil is wet, its reflectivity is different than when the soil is dry. So that will allow us to monitor not only locally, but globally about the surface moisture. And let me give you an example. You can see here at the bottom, a storm which was passing over Texas. At the top, you see the soil moisture that we were mapping from spacecraft. And as you would expect, when, the, when it comes in and rains, the surface is more moist. And then we can do it worldwide. So this one for a week in June 2015, it shows you where the soil moisture was. Not very much in the kingdom, but, uh, but we can monitor it. And this is an example in Australia where we actually monitored over a period of four weeks. And it will show where the moisture is in one week and then how it dried up the following week. And then it moisted again and then it dried up. So you could imagine things of that nature would be of great value for farmers you know, people who are doing farming and irrigation. Now, let me move a little bit and tell you about the ocean rise or the sea rise. In actuality, you, you do hear about it, and it's true. Now, there are many people who are skeptical, but in actuality, when I show them this data, then they start believing it. If you look at the bottom right, and we have been measuring that for the last 20 years. We have been measuring the average height, you know, of the ocean down to about a millimeter. And the way we measure it, we use a radar instrument. We know exactly where the spacecraft is because we use GPS, like you use GPS here, except a much more accurate GPS. We send a pulse down to the surface, and then we wait and see when the echo comes back. And we know exactly how fast it's, it's traveling. It's like the speed of light, 300,000 kilometer you know, per second. And by measuring that time delay, we can determine exactly where the surface is and reference it to a, what we call a geodetic frame that's relative to the center of the Earth. So the, the ocean is rising on a few millimeters per year, but after 50 years, 60 years, and this has been happening for the last two decades, you can end in many meters of increase in the ocean, and many areas around the world are less than a meter above the surface. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in Singapore, and this is a big issue for them because just a rise of one meter and Singapore airport is flooded. You know, so they are really concerned about what's happening on it. Now you say, what, what's really, what is that water coming from? Well, it's coming from two places. One, we are also have been monitoring using that gravity field, monitoring Greenland and Antarctica. And we're seeing on a regular basis that because of the global warming, ice is melting. So you see it at the top right, it goes up and down because in the winter it gets snow, in the summer, you know, it melts a little bit. But on the average, over the last decade, it has been coming down, losing literally 200 gigatons, you know, per year. So when you calculate that snow and ice going into the ocean, that account to about half the rise that we saw. The other half, we can calculate it as the temperature increases the water expand a little bit, like anything when, when you heat it, and that accounts for the other half. So we know exactly what, what led to that increase in the, in the ocean. 
And, and basically the bottom line, it's all coming because of the, the heating of our atmosphere. That's what melts the snow and that's what expands the water. So that's why you hear, you know, particularly recently in, when we're in England, that there is a lot of concern to keep our temperature change at less than one or one and a half degrees because it leads to all of these effects. You say, big deal, one degree. You know, okay, it will be a little bit warmer. Why are we worried about it? Well, we are worried about it. It could, could melt a glacier. It could melt ice. Water will get into, into the ocean and it will lead to ocean rise, you know, worldwide. So it will impact, you know, everybody. Now, the reason I want to show you this, particularly in a university environment, this is a mission which we launched a couple of years ago. This whole spacecraft, I could have brought it in my suitcase. And that's what's happening in the advances in technology that is allowing us, oops, that is allowing us to actually uh, fly small satellites which are highly capable. This satellite was used with radar instrument to map the rain. So what you can see here, as you see along some of these tracks, you see the, the precipitation which was happening you know, in that area using that satellite system. And then we developed another satellite system which we use a microwave emission. So the emitted microwave from rain area is different than if it's not raining and we can map the rain with that capability. So what we are doing now, oh, sorry, and to give you an illustration, that's what the whole satellite looks like. And now you have many universities in the US who are as projects for the students is to go and build spacecraft like this. And that's coming because the advances in microelectronics, the amount of power you have in your iPad, in your computer. In my younger days, we had none of this stuff. You know, I mean, a radar instrument like what I showed you here would have been the size of a room. So now we have been able to really miniaturize like what's happening with your iPhone, moving from an IBM computer which used to fill a room in the 50s and the 60s to now you have more power in your iPad and your iPhone than before. So that's enabling this capability. And many universities are actually have student projects. Hopefully for years, if your faculty are interested and, uh, and the students that are interested, you'll be able to build your own satellite, you know, and launch it. And the reason I was in Singapore is we are going to use this technology to better understand, you know, the, the, what we call the convective clouds, you know, which are in the Pacific. Uh, you know, the Pacific is huge. We know very little about the rain and the clouds and, and the, the updraft which are happening in the Pacific. And what these spacecraft will allow us is to map the updraft every day. And the reason the updraft is important is as, you know, you have the, the, the air moving up, it sucks, you know, the moisture with it, that sucks heat, that's what leads to hurricanes. And then, but as it sucks moisture, brings them up to the upper atmosphere. So now you have water droplet in the upper atmosphere and that reflect more of the sunlight. And therefore it could have impact on the heating, you know, of our planet. Let me add uh, the fourth one is on carbon and what's happening in that one, not only carbon, but gases in the atmosphere. This is, we are able now to monitor and that was taken from your, uh, you can look at your iPhone on eyes on earth and it will show you where is the carbon dioxide, you know, worldwide. And we have been monitoring this for years and the carbon dioxide is steadily increasing, you know, on our planet. And that's creating a larger greenhouse effect. Now, the reason carbon dioxide heats our planet is similar to if you leave your car out in the sun and you have your window closed and you come back two hours later, it's very hot inside, hotter than outside. And the reason is that the sunlight goes through the glass, heats the inside of your car, but then when the energy or the thermal energy, the heat is trying to go out, the glass is very opaque for heat. It doesn't let heat come out. That's why your car gets gets pretty hot. That's why you leave the window open, you know, on it. The same thing, carbon dioxide. It lets the sunlight comes in to the surface. It heats the surface. And when the heat is trying to get out, carbon dioxide blocks it. And that's why it's called the greenhouse, you know, uh, gas on it. And that has led to a regular increase. So if we don't minimize or, or reduce our carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we're going to keep being heating and heating and heating like your car parking and 
And one I want to end by showing you one last thing, because that's kind of interesting, uh, is uh, uh, methane. We think, tend to think about carbon dioxide. Well, it turned out that methane is also a greenhouse gas. Matter of fact, it's far more powerful than carbon dioxide. There is not as much of it, but it's far more powerful. So there is a lot of interest here in the kingdom we have been interacting with Aramco. They would like to know where, because methane comes out mostly from the oil refinery, oil pipeline, and so on. So the, so the, they are very, would like to know where are the leaks which are happening. And it's, you know, they have a huge network of pipelines, or the oil companies have a huge network of pipelines. So this will allow them to monitor it, you know, from space and determine where the leaks are. Well, there is an additional feature I wanted, the reason I wanted to show this to you. Now, up to now, most of the satellite monitoring the environment are done by government agencies. But then recently, in the last few years, many commercial companies, you know, particularly startups, are doing similar satellites and flying them, particularly these small satellites that they can do fairly easy and, and sell the data. Now there is a new feature which is happening on this specific satellite that here there are philanthropists, they are concerned about the environment, and they are putting their own money to actually fly satellites like this and make the data available to everybody. So this is changing a little bit, if you want, uh, how satellites are being approached from only government to government and commercial to government and commercial and philanthropists who really want, you know, uh, care about our environment. In this case, the satellite is about $100 million dollars and a group of philanthropists donated money to the Environmental Defense Fund in the United States. And that, that organization is actually building, you know, the satellite. So I'm going to stop here. So that's hopefully gave you an idea about what's happening, you know, in, the, in monitoring our planet and, and the importance of continue doing this. And hopefully many of you, one of these days, will end becoming, you know, involved in space activity. The kingdom is... Uh, forming a state, com I mean, a space commission, uh, and will have developing a space agency similar to NASA in the United States, uh, and also CACS will be playing a major role. So hopefully, you will get involved in these kind of things, which are important to all of us on our planet. And thank you very much for it. I guess, do we have time for, to answer a few questions? Okay. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, and now the floor is open for questions, if you have any question. And if you are shy about asking them, I will stay around for a little bit after, so you can come down and we can talk. Sorry, go ahead. You mentioned something about the beyond visible. No Something about what's beyond visible. Like oh, I you see. Can go, you can penetrate yeah, yeah. Uh, using the, uh, I think, microwave. Uh, uh, microwave uh, to detect the uh, composition of. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, these radars, that's how they work, is, is using microwave. Uh, but now with the technology, we can go at any part of the spectrum. Not only visible and not only microwave, but also infrared, you know, which will tell us about the heat emission. Uh, but for penetration below the surface, only the microwave can do that. You know, because, uh, you know, visible, let's say if you are inside your house and somebody shine a light outside, you don't see it if, every, if the windows are closed. But your TV will work and your radio will work and your iPhone will work. Even if you are in a cave, it will work because the microwave actually can penetrate through that. So, so it's so really only the microwave that can do that. So my question, how do you how deep? It depends on the, the area. So for in the area like in Saudi Arabia where it's very dry, uh, you can penetrate four, five, six meters. Not much more than that. Uh, in areas which are very wet or the humid, we don't penetrate much because, because the water molecule absorbs. And that's like why your microwave oven works is because whatever you put in it, if it had any liquid, it absorbs the microwave and it gets hot on doing that. So yeah, it's only in very dry region, but you know, a large part of the world is very dry. So most of the kingdom, we can penetrate many meters, you know, below the surface through the sand and actually see the bedrock, which is the, just below it.
Okay, well, thank you for your attention and best wishes with, with your studies and all what you are doing. Take care. And as I said, I'll, be, I'll wait for a little bit in case. Thank you, Dr. al Ashi, for this amazing and informative presentation. Tru truly appreciate sure, it. Sure. On behalf of the university, I'd like to thank you, thank um, your team, people who came all the way from uh, uh, California and Florida, uh, GPL, <laughs> and uh, also I'd like to thank uh, uh, CAXT, uh, Dr. Majid, uh, and your team. Uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you for all Actually, the students. Thank you, uh, Nisreen. Thank Nisreen thank for you, convincing Nisreen, me. <laughs> for, uh, <laughs> she's, uh, by the way, uh, alumni of Al Faisal University. Yeah. And she worked with Dr. Al Ashi. Uh, on a project at Caltech and uh, the opportunity is there by the way for any student here to um, uh, work at, uh, at Caltech. A summer program is available for um, international students. We had conversation this morning at the president's office and uh, 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 Dr. Alashi uh, uh, mentioned that uh, yes, uh, they can uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, accept students, the opportunity is available, but you have to go through the application process. Yeah. Uh, and not only at Caltech, almost every university in the almost. United States have summer programs. Yes, they all have summer programs. Um, the other option is to go through CAXT, um, our partner here uh, in Saudi Arabia, and many students actually do go through CAXT and um, either uh, during summer, uh, spend the summer uh, doing research here, and uh, CAC has a very strong relationship with uh, many international entities. So they, they involve students in real, uh, real life uh, experience, um, very interesting projects. So uh, today was just a, um, uh, you know, a, a glimpse of what, 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 what can be done. Amazing, amazing uh, uh, ideas, projects uh, uh, that uh, uh, people can, of course, uh, uh, be innovative and creative and eventually benefit the, the entire world uh, with these uh, interesting technologies. Once again, I would like to thank Dr. al -Ashi on behalf of Al Faisal University and our students, uh, thank you so much. And as a uh, uh, you know, a thank you recognition, we have oh, a, a, a certificate signed by our president. I'd like to have maybe a, a picture here in the middle, please, Dr. Ashi. Oh. Uh, <laughs>